also helped develop, compile, and present a $265 million budget. Now, that's a lot of money in, in 2012. It was a lot more money in 1985. And the 12 senior vice presidents flew across the country to the, the top floor of the home office of the Travelers for this presentation. And I, I have to tell you this funny little story because it, it cracks me up to this day. So I, I am nervous as a cat. Right? I got to go to the bathroom. I got to get a drink of water. I'm nervous. So I, I, you know, three months before the thing, I got to go out. So I'm heading out down the hall to the restroom, and this gentleman comes bustling up and says, excuse me, son, would you give me a cup of coffee? And I said, uh, well, um, sure. I, uh, right after my, the presentation, uh, sure. And I just zipped on, and I realized, boy, I probably didn't handle that very well. So I, I'm racing back to the, uh, to the room, and he's in the room. And he sees me walk to the front of the room, and his jaw goes like that, and his eyes go like that. <laughs> and he's thinking to myself, oh, no, whose son did I just insult, and am I going to be fired? Um, I, I, could just, I could just read it in his face. And so the presentation goes relatively well, either, even though my knees were shaking underneath my suit. You had to have conviction. You had to have confidence. And you had to present it to these guys. Because they're looking to, at your body language. They're listening to your intonation. And you had to believe in yourself. And, and I did a lot of praying before that meeting. And trust that God would, would help you. And it went well. And on my way out, um, I caught him at the back of the room. And I said, Say, I don't think we got off on the, the right foot. And I introduced myself and said, how about we go for that coffee? And the poor guy was so shook. He was like, huh, what? Oh, no, I'm good, I'm good. <laughs> so it was just a, a funny aside. But he, I, I'm sure you assumed I was a page because nobody that young gets a chance to see the, the home office at, at that age unless you're a page. And I'm very, very fortunate. People spend their entire careers working 30 or 40 years just to get to the home office. And I was able to be in that environment and see how people worked and see the hours that they spent and how dysfunctional their families had become and the fact that they were always traveling, they were always working, their lives, their personal lives were in shambles, their health was, was poor. And I got to see that and said, wow, if that's what it's all about, then I'm not interested. I'm looking for a much better rounded life, time with my family, things of that nature. And um, I decided then and there that, you know, the home office thing was not for me. But I did know uh, upon graduation one thing. I would never work for my father. Now, I felt I could do it on my own and didn't want to write anybody's coat strings or, or apron strings or whatever. That was pride and that was foolish and that was dumb. It's not just what you know, it's also who you know. And in today's environment, it is very, very difficult to get a good job. There's like 24 million people out there looking for work. Now, I know that the unemployment numbers say 8.2%, but that's because in 1992 they changed the formula because they didn't like what the real number was, and they don't longer count people who gave up looking or people who've exhausted benefits. So you're competing with somewhere between 20 to 4 million people. If you have family, if you have neighbors, if you have friends that have a business that you have any inclination towards at all, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Don't say no. God could have put them in your path for a reason. Don't be proud like I was. Take the interview, learn from them, explore the opportunity. Um, I'm going to come back to what to look for um, <coughs> a little bit later, but I, I, that was one of my mistakes that I made. Now, I did think, however, that someday I might buy that company because I had been an entrepreneur before. I enjoyed that. Now, not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. There's a lot of risk. You've got to have a lot of steel, you've got to have a lot of faith, and you've got to be ready to work incredibly hard. Um, so I took, well, I should back up. I was offered several positions upon graduation. And um, I turned down a $40,000 starting salary in the, Har in the Traveler's Home Office in Hartford, Connecticut to work for $21,000 a year in the claim department. Now, why on earth would I do that, right? Today, it's in vogue to go with the highest dollar, right? That's what it's all about. Well, I already knew I didn't like it in there. Why would I limit myself into a field where I know I didn't want to be? Further, if I was stuck in the home office, the ivory tower, if you will, I didn't know what the real world was like on the street, how insurance was done on the street. And in the claims department, there, there's no better place. You're dealing directly with people who have been hurt, harmed, have had losses, and you're seeing how it actually works. So I decided to go into claims world. Now, typically, you'd start in personal lines for three to five years, and if you showed some, uh, some ability, they would put you in a small commercial, small business, for another three to five. 
and then mid-market commercial, several hundred thousand dollar a year premium accounts. And after 15, 20, 25 years, if you show the aptitude, they put you in national accounts. These are multi-million dollar accounts. They decided in their infinite wisdom to put me directly into national accounts. Sink or swim. Instead of a three-month training program, it was six weeks. When you go to interview for a job, ask about their training program. Ask if it's written. Ask if it's formal. Ask if they cut it short and, and wonder what uh, circumstances they would do that. I got walked to my desk and said, here's your files. There's 300 files. Let me know if you have any questions. That's a nice way to get started. I looked at the files and said, oh, good. They're labeled. That's good. So I put them in alphabetical order, picked up the first one, opened it up, read it through, picked up the phone and called Attorney Lieberman. He was not yet a senator. He's a senator today in Connecticut. And we worked on our first case together. And a 42-year-old woman who went into that department with me was gone in three weeks because of the stress and the incredible hours you had to work, 70 to 90 hours a week. In addition to that, I worked on two um, master's classes a year and worked out two hours a night to try to relieve the stress. No, my life was not in balance. I was not where I wanted to be ultimately. However, it was a means to an end, not the ultimate end. And I was an inside adjuster where the calls would come in, I would take the information, I'd try to gather information over the phone, and then I became an outside adjuster. Very different. Now I'm going to accident scenes. I'm interviewing claimants. I'm interviewing witnesses. I'm getting copies of police reports and actually going to where the event transpired. I'm going down into New Haven in the north end of Hartford where you only go at 7 o'clock in the morning because that's when the, the drug dealers and the, uh, the, the, the druggies are still asleep and passed out so it's safe to go to places like that. It was quite an experience. And again, these are not small accounts. These are national multi-million dollar accounts, municipalities, water districts. It was like drinking from a fire hose. That's the best way I can describe it. You're on adrenaline all the time. I learned so much in those few years in claims. And then they promoted me to be a litigation specialist. Now I'm going to pretrials. I'm 23 years old. I have a quarter million dollar settlement authority. And I'm walking into these pretrials with judges and attorneys that are almost three times my age who would smile as I walked in. They would not smile when I would walk out because I did my homework. And they usually won it, sadly. And I would usually win. And it was the first time I was able to take that competitive side coupled with my intellect, and it was kill or be killed. And it was fun. But it was a high-stress job, and it was not a long-term healthy job. I, I looked at some of these guys that had been there a long time. Two guys in particular, I'll never forget, in their 50s. And they'd hit the glass ceiling in the corporate world, and they were being forced out. And that's, that's what happens in the large stock companies. Smaller regionals and mutual companies, they treat their people much, much better. But in the big stock companies, if you're not through that glass ceiling, you get to a certain age, and you have a bullseye on you, and they start to force you out. And by then, you have kids in college, and they've got you. And these poor guys, I, I would get in at 6 in the morning. They were already there. I would leave at 8 or 9 at night. They were still there. They were overweight, high blood pressure. They had two-foot stacks of files across their whole desk. They had this one little space to work at, and they had their, their, their medications on the top. I'll never forget it. I looked at those two guys, and I said, I am never going to allow myself, Lord willing, to be in a position where someone else is dictating my future. That's not going to be where I'm going to be ultimately. Great place to learn. And, but that was not the, the final deciding thing. The final straw for me was we had a, a crisis in the claims department, so much so that management called 200 people together and brought the problem to the floor. It took some guts to do that. It also took a pretty big problem to do that. They said, here's our backlog of files. And they had the nice graphs and color graphs. It was very, very professional. And at the bottom line, the backlog was running away. We were not keeping up with the new claims coming in, and the number of claims was rising that we, hadn't, we couldn't settle them fast enough. And the one parameter they gave us is that we will not outsource these files to an independent claims adjuster. That's another profession. We want them to be handled by travelers' employees. Are there any ideas? And I looked to my right, and there was no hands. And I looked to my left, there was no hands. Up goes Stephen's hand. And I said, sir, how many people do we have in our claim department? About 200? He said, that's correct. I said, okay. Is it correct that our turnover rate is 20% a year or 40 people? And he's like, yes. Translated, this better be good and where are you going with this? 
And I said, uh, well, if we can only use travelers and employees, and this is a pretty steady turnover percentage, he said, yes, then why don't we hire 80 people for one year? In one year, you'll be perfectly staffed with people with approximately a year experience. And in two years, you'll be right where you are today, except we'll have driven down the backlog. And he said, well, we can't do that. Now, this is when I was stupid. This is another mistake I made. Can I ask why? I still cringe, knowing what I know today. And then he answered, which I was shocked. He said, well, because we've never done that before. And I went, okay, this is not the place for me. <laughs> because if that's, if that's how you limit your thinking, you're never going to move forward as a company. So that's when I decided it was time to get into underwriting. I'd had four parts, uh, about 40% of my master's degree behind me. I researched the industry, found an industry leader in American states. They were a real industry leader in automation, so much so that when they sold, they actually auctioned themselves off. I've never heard before or since of an insurance company that actually auctioned themselves off, just like any other auction. And the Hartford had it, and at the last second, Safeco threw an extra $200 million at it because they wanted that underwriting system. And I could pull up an account, review it, order loss runs, check out the DNB, incorporate the agent's changes, and issue that policy in two minutes, no file, all electronic in 1989. There's a lot of companies that can't do that today. Um, the only other thing I want to say about uh, underwriting is, uh, was another life lesson. God's principle of always do unto others uh, as you'd have them do unto you, the golden rule. Uh, at that time, the Hispanic community was finally you know, arriving in Hartford, Connecticut, and was working its way into the business world. And they were all file clerks. And most of the underwriters treated them disrespectfully. I'll just say it that way. I had learned Spanish as a kid. I'd actually researched it, found out that French was a static language, and, and uh, Spanish was growing exponentially and would for 40 years to come. And I said, oh, I guess maybe I won't take French. I'll take Spanish instead. And uh, so I would greet them in Spanish. Hola, como estas? Uh, me llamo Esteban, que es su llama? You know, what's your name? Tell them who, my, who I was. And just chat briefly, and I butchered the language after that, but I tried and showed them a little respect. And uh, noticed after a while that whenever I needed a file, because um, American states had bought Covenant, and they were in converting from one system to another, so periodically you'd actually need a paper file. I'd get my files in like 10 minutes. 